A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode it's A Brush With, Arthur Jaffer, whose work in film, sculpture and installation explores black being with an unflinching eye for systemic and historic inequity and violence and an exuberant harnessing of disparate manifestations of black and particularly African American culture. AJ, as he's known, has only garnered major art world attention in the past decade, but in that time he's been prolific in creating landmark works that have shocked, stirred and moved his audiences. AJ was born in Tupelo in Mississippi in 1960. He initially studied architecture and film at Howard University in Washington, D.C., but film became his preoccupation. He had relatively early success when he won Best Cinematographer at the Sundance Film Festival for his work on Julie Dash's now enormously influential film Daughters of the Dust from 1991. He went on to work on films by Stanley Kubrick and Spike Lee and shot three important documentaries in the 1990s, Seven Songs for Malcolm X from 1990 by a former guest on this podcast, John Aconfra, A Litany for Survival, The Life and Work of Audre Lorde from 1995, directed by Ada Gay Griffin and Michelle Parkinson, and Louis J. Messiah's documentary, W.E.B. Du Bois, A Biography in Four Voices from 1997. Early in the 2000s, he began showing in some art galleries and museums, including in the Whitney Biennial, before retreating from the art world for some time. But in 2013, he made the short film Apex, which drew from his vast library of images, using 841 fast-moving found pictures in a film he described as a trailer for a movie that doesn't exist. It was shown at screenings but didn't gain wide attention, yet formally it hinted at what was to come, as did a work made soon after that, Dreams Are Colder Than Death from 2014, a documentary and essay film reflecting on the legacy of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. In the film, diverse footage is accompanied by leading artists and writers' thoughts on the contemporary experiences of black people in the US in relation to Dr. King's words, what AJ described as voicing their feelings about where they were, but ostensibly where we are collectively. Both Apex and Dreams Are Colder Than Death paved the way for AJ's breakthrough work, at least in terms of the visual arts. Love is the message, the message is death, completed in 2016. That film, made not from still images but from found online video footage alongside his own original material, has come to be seen as one of the most important video pieces of this century. The found material ranges from scenes of black community in glimpses of celebration and religious worship, to footage of renowned athletes, Serena Williams dancing on centre court at Wimbledon, a LeBron James slam dunk, Muhammad Ali in the ring, two musicians performing from Jimi Hendrix to James Brown, Nina Simone and the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, to short bursts of original film of AJ's cultural peers, including the artist Martine Sims and the writer and academic Sadia Hartman. Interspersed among them are appalling scenes of trauma, two women in the floodwaters after Hurricane Katrina and regular images of routine police brutality captured over a long period. But there's also defiance, scenes of protest, footage of Barack Obama singing Amazing Grace at a ceremony after the 2015 murder of nine African-American people in South Carolina by the white supremacist Dylan Roof, and images of key political figures from Shirley Chisholm to Dr King and the activist Angela Davis. Accompanying this fast-moving footage is Ultralight Beam, the 2016 song by Kanye West, arguably his most gospel-heavy recording, which AJ interrupts to dramatic effect at various key moments. That numerous museums simultaneously screened Love is the Message in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd in 2020 reflects the scale of its impact. Following that work, AJ made longer films using similar strategies and techniques. A Kingdom Cometh As, from 2018, is an extraordinary gathering of footage of religious song and sermon, including a mesmerising clip of Al Green singing Jesus is Waiting, for instance, but also of gospel singers like Leandria Johnson delivering arresting performances to church audiences. Arguably the key sequence, though, is when AJ edits together images of raging wildfires in the US and soundtracks them with Aretha Franklin singing the gospel song Be Great 
faithful. In 2019, meanwhile, AJ won the Golden Lion for the best work in the international exhibition of the Venice Biennale for his astonishing video, The White Album. The film focuses on white supremacy and alongside beautifully shot imagery of white people who are AJ's friends. It features, among much else, footage of a young racist YouTuber, the anti-racist rant of a former white nationalist, Dixon White, and chilling CCTV footage of Dylan Roof on his way to murdering those nine churchgoers in Charleston in 2015. AJ has also expanded his artistic and cinematic languages. He's produced a distinctive strand of sculptural work, including the installation Large Array, which features cut-out, blown-up images turned into standing sculptural reliefs. They allude to his influences and preoccupations, from Billie Holiday lying in her casket, to images of the Sex Pistols and Iggy Pop, to nods to artistic forebears like Katie Nolan, to whose work Large Array is a direct allusion, and Adrian Piper. Larger Ray also features the cartoon figure La Rage, one of a number of pieces that AJ views as self-portraits, adding up to a kind of self-mythology. The 2021 film Aghidra was also a departure, using digital animation to create a turbulent black sea and monumental waves, a contemporary sublime that hints at a post-apocalyptic world. But inevitably, in presenting a tempestuous oceanic form, AJ was addressing the history of slavery. He described Aghidra in relation to the enveloping light works of James Terrell. The film, he said, is a Terrell while you're chained in the bottom of a boat. In 2024, AJ has presented what may be his most ambitious piece to date, first at the Gladstone Gallery in New York and soon at Spruth Margas in Los Angeles. Its title has until now been written as five star symbols as if they're replacing a word and it's been known as redacted. But in our conversation, AJ confirmed that he had always intended to call it Ben Gazzara after the Hollywood actor. This stunning film reworks the climactic scene from Taxi Driver, Martin Scorsese's 1976 movie classic in which the protagonist, Travis Travis Bickle, played by Robert De Niro, massacres a pimp and two men visiting the 12-year-old sex worker, Iris. AJ had read that the movie's screenwriter, Paul Schrader, had written the pimp character Sport as a black man, but this was changed when it came to the film's production and the role was given to a white actor, Harvey Keitel. As we'll hear, using cutting-edge technologies, AJ was able to replace all the white victims in the massacre with black actors. He then repeats the scene 13 times, each with subtle and sometimes not-so-subtle differences, making the film a brutal and devastating watch. But he also adds new footage, including a scene where Sport, who in his African-American incarnation is now called Scar and is played by the actor Jarrell O'Neill, smokes a cigarette outside the building while listening to ads from Stevie Wonder's 1976 masterpiece Songs in the Key of Life. As with everything AJ does, music is at the heart of Ben Gazzara, and it's this with which I began our conversation. AJ wrote a kind of manifesto for his work some time ago, in which he said, I want to make black cinema with the power, beauty and alienation of black music. So I asked him, why does he seek to aspire to the condition of one art form through another? Um, I have a, like a kind of curious relationship to it. It's a bit of a mantra, I guess, in a way. It's something that I said so long ago, but along with things like Black visual intonation, which are things that I said in one context way, way prior to me ever kind of imagining where my career such as it is now or anything. And then it seems to come back to somewhat, I don't know if it's haunting me is the right way to talk about it or think about it, but you know, you have to kind of contend with it. It's like a person, you know, really was another person in a lot of ways. And so my relationship to those statements, mantras, whatnot, you know, it shifts from day to day sometimes. So, you know, things that you meant offhandedly or even jokingly in some instances become, I don't know if calcified is the right word, but they become like meta phrases, like meta. <laughs> like when people say like black visual intonation, it was really curious about five or six years ago when I realized that something that I had meant in very specific technical terms had been taken up in the art world as some sort of meta position for me or something like that. So, but you know, in itself, it just speaks to, you know, something, I don't know who I've heard it attributed to a number of people, everybody from Gortha to whoever that all art aspires to the condition of music. So on one hand, it's that, but also in the context of just as a Black American, as a person of African descent in the Americas, in the West, 
You know, it really does speak to the sort of privileged positionality that music has in sort of Black being or in the Afro-American continuum. So, you know, I've said before that so much of it is the conceptual dimension of what it is I'm interested in, you know what I mean? Like sometimes I feel like whether it's cinema, art, video, painting, architecture, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's like what I'm really trying to get at is something about or around that circles around the tension between an imagined or maybe virtual idea and the possibility for it being concrete. Like can something be both immaterial and concrete at the same time? So if one proposes something like black aesthetics or a continuity of ideas and values around beauty, which not necessarily are fixed, but are coherent, let's say. So if one imagines a sort of natal context, presumably African, where there's certain values about what is and isn't beautiful, what is and isn't ugly, which I guess you would say is the opposite of beautiful. The instances in which the thing that is ugly is the most powerful thing, you know what I mean? Like I've gone on in the past talking about my love for uh, Jamaican album covers, you know, which are in so many ways not good. The printing is not good. You know, the sort of graphic design aesthetic is, you know, recognizably from a certain vantage, amateurish, let's say, uh, maybe irregular, you know, but undeniably powerful, uh, has a lot of associative power for, well, Black people in particular, but I think even not just Black folks, you know what I mean? So once you're into this realm where the whole idea of value is a uh, relative, let's say, you know, it opens up a lot, a lot of really interesting questions around intentionality, desirability, X, Y, and Z. So, you know, there's a term that I coined years and years ago when I was trying to speak to something on this paradoxical nation relationship to some fixed or objective notion of what was desirable or beautiful or something like that. And I would say the look that I was going for, and this was kind of in specifically like kind of technical terms again, but in that same way as come to take on a larger, broader implications for me. I use the term abnormative. You know, I would say I was going for an abnormative look. And so Jamaican album covers would be a great repository or instance of an abnormative look, or like early YouTube would be like, particularly when you would see things like public access television or Christian television shows, particularly the ones from the late eighties and nineties where they're videotaping somebody posting them online, they have a certain character. So it's very interesting, the idea of pursuing something that is in fact, Certainly not in any normative kind of sense, good, you know, the pursuit of something that's not good, but nevertheless is desirable or powerful or appropriate. It's interesting hearing you there talking about two very different cultural forms and about you as this consumer of such an enormous range of visual information from a really young age. I read that when you were 12, you were putting together scrapbooks of images. What do you think is behind that lifelong impulse, you know? Talk to my therapist, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm a little resistant to that reading, you know, because I never want to be like the archive king or something like that, you know? But, you know, I think like, you know, musicians use notes. Most of the times they use notes that everybody's heard over and over, but nobody says that composers are archival because they're using predetermined set of notes, you know, they're just reorganizing the notes. So I don't know, I just think, you know, I'm dealing with material. I've always argued, it's a kind of lazy thinking, this whole archival fever thing, you know, everybody like. But I think it's lazy. I don't think YouTube, which would probably be the primary source of certainly my video material, you know, the quote unquote found video material, is not an archive in any kind of classic sense of archive in which when things enter into it, they are then policed and officiated. And once they go into the archive, they never come out. And, you know, once access to those things 
are controlled or regulated. You know, YouTube is not like that at all. You're going to YouTube, it's the ocean. You go to YouTube, sometimes the stuff is there, sometimes it's not there. But sensibly, everybody has free and clear access to it. It's fairly anarchic to a certain degree, you know? So, you know, I don't know if my practice is archival, then I would say life, you know, maybe as everybody says, this is assimilation, then life is just inherently archival. But if it's that imminent, what's the point of even describing it as archival? So I'm a little resistant to this sort of narrative that's accrued because, you know, people read these press releases and they just start repeating things over and over and over and over. So this whole idea that I had this sort of primordial archival impulse, you know, like anybody else, you know, I like the things I like, you know, I like records. So I have tons of records. Most times, you know, if a person has a thousand records, nobody says they're musical archivists. You know what I mean? I think it's, it's a little pat. Now I haven't said that. I do compulsively gather images. I was talking to a really close friend of mine uh, just yesterday and she was saying when she first met me, it was about magazines. You know what I mean? So I would just like compulsively, and to me, it's just, I mean, if you're interested in being fed, would you describe a person who goes to restaurants as being archival? It's, <laughs> they just want to get fed, you know what I mean? And you go to where it is that you want to be fed. It's like, I'm less preoccupied with keeping the images, so to speak, or collecting or archiving the images than I am in consuming the images. So, you know, like so many things in a capitalist environment, I'm a consumer, you know, so I consume things and uh, occasionally I spit them back, you know? Yeah. And I guess it's what happens when you spit them back that's the most interesting thing, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily. It's interesting to some people, you know what I mean? It wasn't interested in to hardly anybody before maybe seven to eight years ago. I mean, I say hardly anybody, I mean like relative. It was kind of interesting to my friends because, you know, it was like I was sharing things that I saw that were dope or interesting or cool, you know, but I don't know that there was any real interest in the quote unquote art world or the larger culture. So I, I, again, I'm not trying to be contrarian. You know, most of the times you just go along with these sort of readings and stuff because you could spend your whole life trying to correct people. But in as far as you're asking me the questions, I'm trying to answer them as honestly as I can. More often than not, it's a yes or no, you know? Right. Yes and no, maybe. Yeah. One of the interesting things, and I think it's really clear from your output in the last decade, is that you have deliberately for instance, created solo exhibitions which you have aimed to look like group shows. And that diversity of language is also present in the way that you make moving image films, make films, videos, etc. So there's entirely self-generated work, there's found work, etc. How much of that is a deliberate strategy? You know, is it just, okay, here's the subject I want to take on and this is the way I, I want to do it? Tell me about that decision-making. A lot more intuitive than people might think. You know, I'm a flitter. I just flitter from one thing to the other, whatever it is, you know, that I'm interested in. I increasingly feel free to just pursue whatever it is I'm interested in without necessarily having to uh, legitimize or uh, explain why it is that I'm interested in. Of course, you know, oftentimes... You know, I'll have these pronouncements about something I made, even though more often than not, their pronouncements in the realm of my process, I very seldom talk about what something means. Say, for example, sometimes I'll talk about what I was thinking about, what something meant to me, but like on the level of some sort of assessment of what declarative to mention the thing is I just don't do very much of that kind of at all. So some of these things are rationalizations that happen after when my sort of positionality and relationship to the work or the artifact becomes closer to any other person's positionality and relationship to it. You know, I come back to things, I see them from a new vantage or fresh eye. Uh, I have mm, not fixed metrics of when I think something worked, but you know, I have some fairly stable metrics about when I think something works or not. And one of them certainly is, that when I return to a work that I see something in it that I hadn't recognized before or I hadn't intended, you know what I mean? That seems unintentional. It's like something about seeing something that seems 
fairly coherent, but you know that you didn't do it intentionally seems to be a mark of the thing working on a certain kind of level that is um, tethered through or tapped into some things that are larger than what your sort of conscious intent might be structuring. Right. Or in fact, just might be accidental. Yeah. Or as they say, coincidental. Or, you know, I joked before, like, you know, one time it's an accident, two times it's a coincidence, and the third time it's culture, you know. So. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and can you, in a way, manufacture or create the best conditions for those things to happen, if you like, as an artist? Yeah, you try. I mean, I try. Like I said, it's often paradoxical. I can't tell you how often I look back on moments when I made X, Y, and Z, and I say, damn, what was that? You know, what alpha state was that? How do I get there? But you don't necessarily recognize it as such when you're in it. You know what I mean? I'm fascinated by how often the first things that people do are the best things that they do. I mean, you can see so many instances. I mean, for every Proust where there's a person who worked a thing until it was just fabulous, you know what I mean? There are as many, if not more, instances of people who did one or two at best and were done, you know, Sex Pistols. They made one album, that was it. I don't know if they ever would have topped that. Arguably the Bad Brains, Roar Cassette is the best thing that they ever did, you know? Not necessarily the very first thing they did, but the first time what they did was consolidated in a certain kind of way. People still argue that John Michel Basquiat in 82 was the best that he ever did. I differ about that a little bit, but I understand what people are speaking to. There was something. So even a friend of mine, you know, I said, oh, I want to make paintings. Uh, well, okay, you know, well, that's different. You can't make paintings the way you make videos or this because, you know, that's a whole nother thing. Like, you know, that takes a lifetime, X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, mm, yes and no. Like for every... You know, Leonardo da Vinci, who spent his life perfecting his painterly practice or whatnot, there's a boss guy who did within the first eight, nine months of him putting paint to canvas. Of course, he was drawing and scribbling and stuff like that. And you see those early drawings, collages and stuff, they don't give any indication necessarily of where he was going, you know, and even though, in fact, people did recognize from the very beginning that something was going on, something unusual and magical and atypical was going on. But like a lot of times I would put that to his appearance in the, that was maybe the New York, New York show, you know, where he had these very abstract sort of markings and stuff, you know on paper and on the wall and stuff like that. And it's very different to look at it in hindsight, but a historical record doesn't lie. People saw those things and were very, very, very excited about them. And so you go from there from the first time when he's actually starting to work on canvas and it's those car crash things where he very crudely drawn cars, smashing into each other, into buildings and stuff. And, you know, I would argue if that was all he'd ever done, he would be a footnote at best. At best, but nevertheless, inscribed in those things and people recognize was something. But essentially, within eight months, he's baking the masterpieces yeah. that his reputation rests on. You can make it 12 months if you want, depending on, you know, where you draw the line that it's a masterpiece and it's not a masterpiece. But clearly within 12 months of him actually having canvas and paints to work on, he's generating the body of work that his reputation rests on, you know? So I don't know, like maybe it's not fair to compare anyone to a boss scout or something like that. But, and then I'm also always fascinated by those instances of themes that were generated in a sense, not even authored, like nobody really authored the things, but they are as great or as powerful or as anything I personally have ever seen. Like my personal pantheon, of the things that are the bar for me are so often not even the products of quote unquote return artists, you know? And then there's a whole class of outside artists who sort of self-trained and they have some very complicated, non-normative, problematic relationship with the canonical continuities of art making or something like that. So I wanted to ask you about speed and speed of making because is it right that you basically cut love is the message in about two hours 
It's true, but a lot of times when people say you edited it in two hours, I was like, I think it's more accurate to say that I assembled it in two hours. I mean, I just strung them together. I had some files that were like basically material that was gathered for something else. That thing went south. I found myself sitting with free time and I just strung them together in about two hours. I would say 85 to 90% of it was as it ended up being within the first two hours. Certainly the beginning, the first shot, certainly the last shot, James Brown. I never changed the order of it from that first thing, but I did maybe add another 10, 15% over the next three months. Things got dropped in. In a couple of instances, things were substituted for better things. But yeah, I would say essentially two hours, you know, just strung them together. Like I could string something together in two hours. Now it wouldn't necessarily be any good. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know, yeah. two hours is a, is plenty of time to string a seven minute thing together, you know. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? Probably James Brown. But I was recently saying to somebody that I'm definitely like the bastard offspring of James Brown and Jack Kirby. Like if I had to reduce it. I mean, I think those two artists had as profound an impact on me as anybody else I can think of. I can think of people who later... Like Harlan Ellison, the science fiction writer and editor, had a really profound impact on me. But that kind of didn't happen until I was a teenager. Let's say I was a little bit older. But on a primordial level, three, four, five, six years old, it certainly would be James Brown, which is in some ways kind of the first things, not the first things that I heard, because inevitably the first things that I can remember hearing would be on one hand, like Elvis Presley. I was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, which mm. is Elvis Presley's hometown. Grew up there, so it was just everywhere. Dion Warwick and Burke Bacharach's collaborations, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? And those things had and continued to have a profound impact on me. I would never put an Elvis Presley record on. I don't think I've ever put an Elvis Presley record on in my entire life, but even now... I listen to Bird Bacharach right. and work. So those are really, really primordial sort of things that I heard. But at the end of the day, you know, like I say, on one hand, it's definitely James Brown, who I not only heard, but saw in a way. I think my parents took me to a concert when I was maybe three. Oh, my God. Maybe four, maybe <laughs> four. Because this is all pre-even seeing Black people on television. I mean, you got to understand it. Right. Like, you don't start to see Black people outside of, like, sports. You don't start to see Black people on television until the latter half of the 60s, you know. I was born in 1960, the end of 1960. So four or five, six years old, it was a rare thing to see Black folks on television. So where was I seeing James Brown? Inevitably, on record covers, and as I said, my parents took me to see James Brown in Memphis when I was three or four, and I don't have any visual memory of it at all. I have very little sonic memory of it. What I mostly have is a memory of the energy of it, yeah, like the energy of people's reactions, the fact that it was a larger enclosure than I had ever been in. You know, it was in an auditorium. So I've been in churches, which would have probably been the largest contained enclosures I've been in, but I've never been in an enclosure that large. Right. And then it's an enclosure largely, probably not solely, you know, I don't know. I wish I could send a drone or probe back to actually look at myself in that context. But as I said, I have no real visual memory of it. I do remember at four or five years old, imitating James Brown, like his dancing and stuff. So clearly I had seen it. Yeah. Uh, again, this is prior to Soul Train or anything like that. So the question is, where the fuck did I see it? <laughs> you know, there was no social media. There was no Black people on television. So where did I even see it? I don't know. But I remember standing in my grandparents' living room, one instance I remember, and they were saying, go, Arthur, go. And I was 
doing my James Brown dance and doing the splits and the whole thing, you know? So if I had to reduce it to one person, it'd probably be James Brown, but a very, very strong second is just about at the same time, maybe a year or two later. So I'm five or six, cause this is prior to starting school, like starting right. first grade. There was a store called Ashby's. It was what we would call now a convenience store. But at the time, it was just like a local, you know, mom and pop corner store. And they had a comic book rack. And, you know, there were the things on that comic book rack you can imagine. Superman, Batman, things like that, which have all had a profound impact on me. But the things that I remember most primordially, like these are like primal memories on that comic book rack were Marvel comics. Yeah. Which were predominantly the creation. You know, I know all these people had these debates. Stanley, Jack Kirby, it's ridiculous. Jack Kirby is the great imagineer of the 20th century. He is our Odysseus and all of that. He laid the groundwork for most of the mythic framework that anybody, even roughly my age or within 30 to 40 years younger, you know, uses. It's Jack Kirby. It's right. Jack Kirby. I don't care what anybody says by Stanley and all that bullshit. It is Jack Kirby. He is the king, King Kirby, Fantastic Four, <laughs> Dr. Doom, all of this shit I remember sitting like, agog at these comic <laughs> books in the way people would be, I guess, obsessed with computer games or addicted to these kids. But I remember just standing there, staring at the covers of these things. You know, I still remember to this day, and this is, again, prior to being six or seven years old, it's now a classic issue when the Fantastic Four were crash on this planet or something and being Grimm, the thing, found himself in this gladiatorial ring like Spartacus, where everybody was forced to fight to survive. He didn't want to fight. And at the end of it, it was this full page panel of the entity that he was going to have to battle. And he was like this very powerful looking guy with all this uh, metal robotic kind of structure. And he just says something at the end of it, like, but in the end of the day, we we're all slaves or something like that. Wow. Yeah. And their brain explodes like at four or five or six years old, you know. And then your avatar or your self-portrait, as you have called it, La Rage, which is a cartoon character, which is a kind of self-portrait. Yeah, I mean, it's a self-portrait in a way that I guess most things are, most of the things that I do are, you know. And it's just the first in a series, you know, I'm just sort of slowly now starting to roll out a whole series of characters that are in. I mean, I never seen it like this, not even thought of it like this as a homage to Jack Kirby, let's say. Because it wouldn't just be to Jack Kirby, it would be to, to all the artists who, Neil Adams, Howard Chaikin, the artists who really had a profound impact on my imagination, if nothing else. But it's a homage, and also, in the same way, I guess, Ben Gazzaria's, it's addressing the absences in the way that you want to, like I said, correct that sort of paternal denial. You know, you want to map yourself into these spaces. You know, I want to put a Black astronaut on the Jupiter in 2001, the Space Odyssey, you know. I remade the pimp in Taxi Driver as he was in a weird way initially envisioned. Yeah. But in that same way, I said the duality or the complicated relationship of like white people pointing at black people, but knowing that pointing in fact is empowering them. You know what I mean? So it's a weird dual kind of thing. It's like, it's the same thing. It's like I saw Taxi Driver in high school mm -hmm. and was troubled by it. certainly the overt racism and just violence of it was troubling, but the sense that something was off about it, yeah. which I said took me another 10 years, you know, I just sort of at some point read, oh, initially that character was supposed to be black. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. It was like you were getting the answer when you saw the, the film to a question that you didn't quite know how to ask, you know? <laughs> That's a person that's banging you in the head with the answer but you don't even quite realize what the question is. And so you're like, oh, the question is, how do Black people figure? And I mean, use that term in all the ways. And figure into this arguably psychotic white imagination. How do we figure into it? Which historical artist do you turn to the most today? Nobody looms large in my imagination than Basquiat for all the obvious reasons in the fine arts context. 
in the larger artistic context, nobody looms larger in my imagination than Michael Jackson, which I think yeah. very few people who are my age would disagree with, you know? But if you ask Michael Jackson or Prince, his primary competitor, who loomed most largely in their imaginations, right? Because they were both born in like, I don't know, 57, 58, which yeah. means they're two or three years older than me, right? That's a distinct thing. Like born in the 50s, the tail in the 50s versus born in the beginning of the 60s. So if you ask Michael Jackson or Prince, who loomed, it's like unquestionably James Brown. Exactly. <laughs> the video is there. Yeah. The only instance I can think of where you see them both perform in the same venue yeah. is at a James Brown concert. And it's one of the most notorious, <laughs> outrageous things ever. And they're both doing their imitations of James Brown, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's like... Incredible. Like in that way, I'm no different than anybody else Black that I know of. We're talking about Basquiat, who I think is still an honorary contemporary artist, despite the fact that he died so long ago in a way. And the next question is about contemporary art and which artists you most admire. I mean, of course, this is in flux, but inevitably, my friend Ann M. Hall, mm. for sure. I think her exhibition practice is the thing that most fires my imagination. It's the, like her exhibitions both inspire me and challenge me. Yeah. You know, I feel when I go into those things like competitive, <laughs> you know, I feel like, shit, what can I do to match this? How can I match this? Again, there's something about conditions of different forms of cultural practice influencing each other in her work. There's an element of rock performance in her work. There's fantastic music. Yeah. There's choreography. There's sculpture. It's, you know, she, doesn't really, like, she doesn't really care what we define it as. And it just exists on so many planes, right? You know, when I've tried to describe to people what I like about it, it's, you know, she's very polarizing figures, like, which is as it should be. I think if you're doing something new, it's interesting, like, how often the very things that I point to as why she's special and why she's particularly interesting to me are the very same things that make other people say is jive, you know? Right. It's like, oh, she's more of a curator than an artist. All this is crazy. It's insane, you know? You know, obviously, prior to her would be a person whose impact on me is probably as significant as Basquiat's, but I don't have the same kind of identification with his because I'm not the same age. She's older. This is David Hammond. This is obvious, yeah. you know? But, you know, knew David since I was 19. Really? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So David, Katie Nolan. Katie is such an interesting topic. It's so interesting because I spoke to Eva Rothschild, the artist, for the last episode of this podcast, and she talked about the transformative effect of seeing Katie Nolan's work. I love the way you've engaged directly with her work in this work called Large Array. Yeah. And actually you've got Katie in the work. <laughs> There's a portrait of Katie, a cut out Covering her face. Yeah, <laughs> covering her face. But that's so indicative of the person as well as the art, right? So I, I love the way that you've engaged with that. You're saying, hello, Katie, through your art, you're acknowledging that influence. I mean, I've communicated with her, but I never met her. We were supposed to meet, but I mean, she's doing her thing. She's a mythic, mythic figure, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to be a mythic figure. For every Jimmy Basquiat who dies in this mythic, there's the Sly Stones and who should have died. I mean, I should have, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's an amazing. Like he survived. Way, yeah. Yeah. Such as it is, you know, surviving. Like, right. You know, what does it mean to be a fucking finger of God and you're living in an RV? Yeah. I mean, that's the consequences of what it means to requires in terms of a kind of toughness to survive when you go to that. Jimi Hendrix place, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Miles Davis. Yeah. Like, there are some people who can go right to the precipice of that thing, look over into the abyss, and pull out. Warhol was one. But see, the thing is, it's like, you have to sacrifice something when you survive that moment. I'm just riffing now. But Kurt Cobain could not have survived the moment in which he died completely intact. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. if you want to step back onto this mortal plane, once you step over into the void, like Wally Coyote, you know, in a road running where he will always go out the cliff and his <laughs> legs would be going around in the air. If you step into that space, it's the rare individual who can step back from it. Miles Davis was a tough motherfucker. You know, he actually was able to step back, take a break, and come back and start 
playing music again. Now, it had no bearing on what he was doing prior to that moment because you can't survive and not sacrifice something like your state of grace or something like that. You know, you got to give up something. Yeah, It's like your state of grace went on, but mm -hmm. you came back. And so you come back, not a shadow who you were, but just different, like transformed. Yeah. So I think Warhol, like if he had been shot and died, we would think about Warhol in a totally different way. We would think about him the way we think about Hendrix and yeah. Janis Joplin. And he never would have made all those kind of weird portraits of royalty and celebrities in the 70s and stuff. Exactly. But he never Which, would have made the shadows. That's the thing. You know, he never would have made the so skulls. Funny that you you know. the shadows. See, like, he's so interesting because that's the instance of the person who looked into the void, stepped back, figured out what to do just to tread water till they could slowly start to escalate again. His engagement with John Michelle, all of that kind of stuff. He never made work more powerful than the shadows. No. That's just the fact of it, even though he made a lot of arguably normatively garbage, let's say, yeah. you know, in the interview period. But that's what surviving when you become godlike, mythic in your own time. That's what surviving looks like. Yeah. You know, the white version of it is you start a magazine called Interview. <laughs> you do a lot of celebrity portraits. The black version of it is just Sly Stone living in a fucking RV trailer in fucking Lemur Park in L.A. That's the black version of it, you know? What do you have pinned to the studio wall? Like about 5,000 things, tons of things. In the um, video that they made for the MCA Chicago show, there was a really interesting detail of your studio. And there were Frank Auerbach paintings like you gathered together. And I thought that was a really interesting thing for you to have around you. Why? Just because I always think of Frank Auerbach as occupying a very particular space in British art. And when you're from Britain, those artists are so hermetically sealed with a particular sphere of cultural significance, if you like. And we've seen all of those artists in a very particular way. And so... I love the fact that Arthur Jaffer's got Frank Auerbach on his wall, you know? I love Frank Auerbach. I would say, or I would suggest, and this remains to be seen because I'm just starting to make paintings, but I would suggest something like Bosco's relationship to Cy Twombly is somewhat akin to my relationship to Frank Auerbach. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 540 cultural organisations through a single download. New guides are added regularly and the latest includes several dedicated to historic sites and buildings from Abbotsford, the home of Sir Walter Scott in Melrose in Scotland, to the Birchfield Homestead Society in Salem, Ohio, where the painter Charles Ephraim Birchfield lived, to the Neuve Kirk, the historic church at the heart of Amsterdam. Among the other guides on the app are numerous museums and galleries that have shown and collected the work of Arthur Jaffer, from Mocha in Los Angeles and MCA Denver in the US to the Serpentine in London and Luma Arl in France. Download Bloomberg Connects and you'll see that the guide to Luma Arl has features on its extensive program, with content exploring what's on in the Frank Gehry Design Tower and the park surrounding it. It includes content on works by former guests on this podcast, including William Kentridge, Helen Martin and Philippe Pereno. And in the section on the 2022 exhibition programme, you can watch Arthur Jaffer discussing his exhibition at Luma, Live Evil. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook and Instagram. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? I don't go to galleries that often. Museums, you say? I thought you were going to ask me what my favorite museums are. Yeah, in a way, it is a favorite museums question. Louisiana, I think, is the most beautiful museum. Uncanny, what it's like to move through it. This is Louisiana in Denmark, in case people don't know. In yeah. Denmark, and Copenhagen, yeah. The Bylers, very beautiful as mm. a space, for sure. But probably at the end of the day, I would say to Louisiana. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? Being born black, <laughs> you right, know, in yeah. this reality, probably. I wanted to ask you about a very, another very early experience from your childhood, which was, that, uh, is it right that you heard Mahalia Jackson sing at your local church? Yeah, that's true. Maybe I was in the first grade. We moved to uh, Alabama, Russellville, Alabama, when I was about four, maybe four or five. They took teaching positions in Russellville. And so 
there was a period where we shuttled kind of back and forth between Alabama and Mississippi. And because my birthday was so late in the year, because I didn't turn six until November the 30th, in Alabama, I couldn't start first grade. You know, I would have to wait to the next year. And my parents didn't want to keep me out of elementary school for another year because I was already bored, you know, because I'd literally grown up in kindergarten. My godmother ran the main kindergarten in Tupelo, Mississippi. So I'd been in that kindergarten since I was, you know, like a baby, basically, in the kindergarten. And so I was ready to start school, you know. I mean, I was acting up because I was bored. And so rather than hold me out of elementary school for another year, the year I was in the first grade, I went to Mississippi. I lived with my grandparents. So away from my family for a year, you know, so I could start school. So my first grade year in Tupelo, Mississippi was in 65, I guess. So that year, my godmother, I think in particular, was doing a lot of support child raising because my parents weren't there. So I spent a lot of time with my godmother. A Mrs. Herbine Reese. And so even though I generally went to church with my grandparents, which was St. Matthew's, I think it was maybe a Methodist church, my godmother took me one Sunday with her to her church, which was unusual. It certainly happened more than once. I remember more than one occasion of going to church with her, but it was pretty atypical. <laughs> it was actually more typical that I went to church with my grandmother. And that was a church I'd grown up in and the church that my parents went to when we were in Tupelo. Yeah. But for whatever reason, that Sunday, my godmother took me to church with her and it made an impression on me. But I didn't think much about it until I was at Howard University, like 10, 12 years later. I was uh, in the library at Howard. Back in the day, you could go to the library and... Uh, check out records. I mean, you couldn't take them away, but they have headphones and you could, like you would do books, you could take records and you could listen to them. Yeah. And I just pulled a bunch of things randomly. Cecil Taylor, I remember distinctly listening to Cecil Taylor records there, uh, unit structures and things like that. And uh, for whatever reason, pulled the Mahalia Jackson record. Listening to it had the most curious reaction to it. Like, I don't know why I picked it, but I was really disturbed. And then at some point, called my godmother and said, Miss Herbeen, did you ever take me to church with you? Because again, this is like, I'm like maybe five years old. Did you ever take me to church with you? She said, oh yeah, Mahalia Jackson was in town. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> because I remember distinctly, like forget Mahalia Jackson, the name, you know? Yeah. It was like if somebody took you to see the Grand Canyon or took you to sit in their car and look at tornadoes coming over the horizon or a lightning storm, you know what I mean? Or took you to Sardis Dam and to see, you know, a dam with the waterfall like that. It was like, she took me to see a phenomena. She may have said the name at the time, but I don't remember that. I don't know if that went over my head. It wasn't enough that I remembered Mahalia Jackson, not in any conscious sense, but when I heard the record, I was like, it made me remember sitting in the space and processing the singing, I had no critical sense of where Mahalia Jackson would fit into some sort of hierarchy or anything like, you know, nothing like that. I didn't have any framework. It was kind of like if you grew up in Idaho or wherever, and you were used to seeing intense thunderstorms. And then all of a sudden, there was like, you know, Hurricane Camille level or something. <laughs> right, okay. You know what I mean? And you're like, I know this is a thunderstorm. I have been blessed to be born at ground zero of thunderstorms because thunderstorms have always been there in the Black church. So it's what I know. Mm -hmm. I know it's a thunderstorm. But all of a sudden, it wasn't a rainstorm. It was a fucking hurricane. <laughs> and so you sit up in your seat even though you have no critical framework to understand, and you know you are in the presence of a more complicated, I don't want to make it hierarchical, but a formulation of the thing that you have grown up inside of, so it's normalized for you. But this thing is so much greater that all of a sudden the thing that's normalized for you becomes not normalized. It's not just something that just happens in black churches, like the church pews, you sit on them, they're always there. Yeah. 
all of a sudden the church pews were like not these flat slabs. They were, you know, <laughs> church pews through Marshall stacks and Wawa pedals and, you know, <laughs> through effects chain all of a sudden. It was like, what? I think even at five, I was like hearing it and trying to grasp this something else that's, it's the thing I know, but this is another formulation or iteration of the thing I know. Right. And it's atypical. Because right. this is not what happens. It is in the class of things that happen in church. It's like you grow up in a house full of cats. And so you know cats. And then one day you walk in the living room, and there's a fucking Black Panther <laughs> on the couch. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, this is a cat. Like, all these other cats I know. But this thing is bigger than any cat I've ever seen. <laughs> it's jet black. And it could very conceivably consume you. That's magnificent. And you know that instinctively, that it's the same species, but this is a completely... <laughs> Utterly different formulation of the species which you are familiar to the point that it's almost not even like the thing you've experienced, but it, it is. And it was like that. Like, and I remember it as, in some ways, I would say, along with James Brown, the earliest confrontation I had with something that I didn't have the language or the conceptual framework to articulate at the time with something like aesthetics. That may be the best moment we've ever had on this podcast. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, which writers or poets do you return to? In terms of language, it's probably true to say, and this is a poet language, that I am way, way more engaged with the language of Black popular music. Mm -hmm. The lyric in Black popular music, if I want to start quoting lyrics or something like that, or lang words, poetically organized, structured, mm -hmm. it's going to be in the music. There's no doubt about that. It's going to be in the Delphonics, you know? Yeah. There's a thin line between love and hate. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Or like Teddy Pendergrass, like, come on and go with me. Come on over to my place. One of the greatest couplets, <laughs> you know, in the history of Western literature. But in terms of writers, let's say, I tend to read primarily for narrative or for ideas, you know, so I've always been a big science fiction fan. Mm. I mean, so, you know, like Peter Watts, who, you know, who wrote Blind Sight and those kinds of things, you know, loved the ideas, loved the ideas. Hey, he's a great writer, but I love the ideas. Greg Egan, Diaspora. I just started listening to, not reading, N.K. Jemison's A Thousand Year Kingdom or something that quartet of books that she did. But, you know, it's so much about the Octavia Butler. Yeah. It's about the ideas. But, like, in terms of poetry, per se, my favorite poet is probably I, A.I., Florence Anthony. Oh, yeah, yeah. Probably at the end of the day. You were involved in that film about Audre Lorde, weren't you? Cinematographer. You were the cinematographer for that film, yeah. Yeah. So, obviously, that was an extraordinary process. It was in that glory period for the amazing documentaries, many of which you were involved in, for instance, the one that you did with John O'Confra about Malcolm X and so on, the Audrey Law documentary. That must have been an extraordinary thing to be involved in. It was. It was. And, um, you know, my friend Greg would always say, you're like Forrest Gump. You just have a, you know, a genius for finding yourself, you know, peeking over the background when they signed the Berlin Accords. So I'm, I was like <laughs> delivering the croissant or something. <laughs> and I'm like, Peeking over what's going on here and they're doing this or that, you know. I just have had an instinct for where something was happening for so long. And in a way, I would just say a lot of it was just accidental, but it just has happened so consistently in my life. It just seems like I have a knack for it. So, you know, I was asked to shoot it. Friends of mine were shooting it. And I mean, shooting documentaries for me were not technically challenging. No. But the thing that was amazing about the experiences I've had working on documentaries is like, I would say they will give you like full blown essay answers to questions that you didn't even know how to ask at the time. You know what I mean? Just in terms of who you met. Like my memories of working on Audre Lorde documentary are things like Audre Lorde saying to me, AJ is such a nice boy. <laughs> Those are my memories of it. You know what I mean? Not like Audre Lorde, the God, like, Right. Bigger. It was like her saying, AJ is such a nice boy. The next question is about music. We've already discussed music so much already, but it's about what music or other audio you listen to while you're working. 
you have different modes of working. So in the edit suite, you're dealing with the sound that's in the edit suite. But as you say, you started painting. Do you have sound on while you're in the studio? I listen to music frequently in the studio, particularly when I'm by myself. But I don't know that I actually listen to music so much when I'm physically working, you know? Like I ended up, stayed here overnight last night in the studios because I got in the groove doing what I was doing. But part of the groove I got in, it was just like totally quiet, you know? Like I noticed I had a pattern of starting to come in later and later to my studio because, you know, everybody's around. Sometimes it's hard to think and get a groove, you know, going. And it just seemed like as soon as I hit the door, I was confronted with all this administrative stuff. Yeah. And so I start, you know, everybody breaks at six. There was a period where I was showing up at four, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I would do what I need to do with people for a tight four hours. And then I had to space to myself to two or three in the morning. So that's the other part of it, too. It's like, you know, if it's late, you're not necessarily they're listening to music. There are people who live above me. I wanted to ask you about a particular use of music in the film Ben Gazzara, the moment where Stevie Wonder's as appears in the film. It seems to me that is the kind of, if you like, the fulcrum of the film, or it's the bit where we suddenly get access to the interiority of the pimp figure. Right. But it's a magnificent performance as well, acting performance. Oh, acting performance. I thought you were about to say Stevie Wonder's performance. Well, yeah, Stevie Wonder's ass like, is clearly him anyway. Yeah, I was like, you know, I was to say, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but the actors, yeah, Jarrell. Yeah. Tell me about why you chose to put that song from that album in that version of this film that you're... The selection of it was intuitive. You know what I mean? I didn't sit down and search for a song that would check whatever number of boxes, you know, like you would in a movie, you would have a musical consultant and they would present to you potential things. It was nothing like that. Totally intuitive. The impulse, like I said, started 30 years ago when I was like, wow, it'd be really incredible if you could renovate or repair or make Taxi Driver what it wanted to be in its full racist glory, let's say. So you wanted the pimp to be black, you know, and I've seen it in print and it's been taken up multiple times. Like, oh, the studio intervened and said black people are going to riot if he goes in and kills all the black people in the end. You know what? I think that's false. Actually, a little bit. I think that is a weirdly self-serving formulation, meaning, first of all, I don't think black people would have rioted because I think. You know, my friend Amy Tauber was saying she remembers seeing it with a bunch of Black folks and people were laughing at it because nobody took the Harvey Cartel character seriously, you know? <laughs> so I don't think it's the same thing people said about do the right thing. Black people are going to riot. Look, Black people don't riot when folks literally walk in churches and shoot us down like dogs. We don't riot. You know what I mean? If we were going to riot because of some shit happened, it would be an ongoing, never-ending riot if we were going to ride because of some shit white people did. That's just the fact of it. I think it's truer to say a film script that was very nervy and like maybe atypically overt in its sentiments and they were intrigued about making it but didn't think it was going to be commercial. But the combination of Scorsese, De Niro was really hot. You know, it was like in that script, it was like, okay, for low budget, this is a win-win. We're going to do this. I actually do think the truth of it is more like the non-starter was Black men passing a 12-year-old Jodie Foster around as a sexual. That's the non-starter. Right. That's the part where it's like, nah, we can't do this. We can't show this. That's it. That's really closer to why it was a non-starter and why it had to be Harvey Keitel. They had to just... I was always struck by the moment in Taxi Driver when he's in the diner and he's talking and there's a cutaway to these two pimps. Yeah. And I always say, even in the moment when I saw it, I was like, these are not actors. They have way too much self-possession to be a black actor. And you include that once in the film. There's several scenes that are repeated, but you include that scene in a single moment in the film, don't you? It's just once. Yeah, exactly. Because it's the first time in the movie where Travis Bickle actually gives voice or articulates his ethos, let's say. Even though it's very guarded, it's the first time he actually speaks, that Travis actually speaks his philosophy. Of course, later in the film, as he's starting to spin out, you know, he's on American, looking at American bandstand and kicks the TV over. He's saying all this stuff about, 
a hard rain is going to come and wash all this filth away and all this. He's seeing those kinds of things. But that's the first moment where he actually, but it's like as he's speaking, they cut to two real pimps. Like to me, that's the return of the repressed. You know what I mean? That's the moment where this move they made ostensibly to keep Black people from rioting, it just psychoanalytically reimposed itself. Right. Like in the Freudian sense, it was the thing that was just giving itself away. Like, this is what's missing. We couldn't even hire an actor to do this. Even a pretend version of this was too much. So now we're going to show you what the real... So the idea of those two guys fucking Jodie Foster, no. There's no mechanism to go there. Right. Even now, there's no mechanism to go there in American cinema. Not with no studio involved. You know what I mean? You can make Harry Portrait of a serial killer. You can have him do whatever the fuck you want him to do. But that's like two steps aboard a porn film. You know what I mean? So there was no version of that that was conceivable. So when it comes to using as? When it comes to using as, once the initial impulse of like, I want to put this thing in a form that is closer to what I think was initially imagined, meaning I want to usher this repressed figure back into the position that they were meant to occupy. And once you set that up and you shoot that and you look at the thing, you know, you say, okay, there's more to do here. And you realize that you want to decenter Travis Bickle's Everything is like structured around his internal worldview. And I don't mean on any kind of political level, you want to decenter, even though that's clearly there. I just mean on the level of achieving a certain kind of equilibrium. Like uh, the thing is balanced. It feels balanced. And so it's compensatory to a certain degree, but it's also just something as simple as Yo, when you see us standing, you have no idea what the fuck is going on in our heads. Most of this shit is being projected onto us. And so when this guy is working, because he is working, the girls are not the only ones working. When he is on the street corner working, ostensibly minding his own fucking business, right? You have no idea what's going on in his head. You don't know if he's thinking about Miles little red book that his older brother gave him the day before. You don't know what the hell is going on. You don't know if he just read Du Bois or whatever. You don't know. It's presumptuous to think that because he's a pimp, he doesn't read. I mean, Iceberg Slim, that was, there's all kinds of stuff he could have been reading. And music is just way more central to a collective Black cultural internal worldview. You know what I mean? Then literature is. It just is. I think most writers would admit this. And in 1975, everybody was listening to songs in the key of life. It was the culmination of Stevie Wonder's great early 70s run of records. You know what I mean? Mm. Starting with Talking Book and, you know, through Intervision and all those things. Arguably the greatest run anybody had in the 20th century. I completely agree. Certainly in terms of popular music. Yeah. Hard to argue what would superseded people had ruptures they had eruptions but nothing like the sustained four albums leading up to the double album songs in the key of life nothing like it right so i remember in 1975 songs in the key of life was on what they call it 24 7 rotation in my house it is what we listened to for a solid year and a half over and over and over and over again. I mean, song after song after song. But at the end of the day, I think arguably the greatest single song on that is As, which is certainly when you take it out of, well, it had no context. It floated. It was just in our lives. But maybe even out of the context of the rest of the record is pretty fucking apocalyptic and spiritual too, you know? Yeah. And so to me, I love the idea of this guy working on the corner, paying attention to who's coming and going, paying attention to what his prostitutes are doing, you know, being vigilant, but at the same time, humming to himself from Songs in the Key of Life and singing out of key to it. It's like bad karaoke, you know? <laughs> like, oh, do you want Jarrell? You should eat out of key. Jarrell's a little tone deaf. He's a genius actor he's definitely a little told <laughs> but you know to have it going in his head and then 
have it run over into the sequence that you've seen over and over of the shooting yeah. and how it totally transforms having that music going over that sequence, which yeah. you've seen, you see 13 times in the film, totally transforms how you experience it. It's not a flaw, but it's one of the technical lapses of the film that the music doesn't go a little bit further into the scene, but it's just like, because of how I sequence it, that was the end. I just realized that was the end of the music. Yeah. That's as the music was fading out. Like if I had more of a Hollywood budget, I would have just, and maybe I'll try to retroactively do it. I would have just looped it or extended, you know what I mean? Made it some like Larry levan s extension. So it goes another 10, cause you need to get him up the stairs at least, Right. but it just kind of ends there. But it makes its point. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? My utter and total struggle with lack of discipline <laughs> <laughs> is about the only thing. You know, I think objectively, I would maybe have to accept that I work hard, but I always feel lazy. I feel like I'm lazy, you know. I've accepted at this point now that it's just my process. It's how I get to it, you know? Yeah. A combination of outbursts, imagining things, outbursts of production, and a lot of procrastination, which I was talking to my business partner, Melinda, and I was just like, I just don't think I'm working hard enough. She was like, only a lunatic workaholic would think <laughs> you're not working hard. You know, only you would think you're not working hard enough. I want to work better, more efficiently. And maybe that's simply understanding that procrastinating and this and that's just all part of my process. So I want to sort of minimize the sort of, you know, internal blowback of it and just accept it's just part of how you get to what it is that you're doing. But sometimes I even think when I'm rationalizing is that I've been able to survive, whereas a John Michelle didn't survive is because I just, I've created a certain, at a distance relationship to my own things I imagine doing. You know what I mean? I've always kept them at an arm's length. It's like I've run alongside that hellbound train, but I've always not wanted to quite jump on it. I think I've survived to be 60 because I, in a way, kept whatever that thing is at an arm's length. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? I mean, my mind is racing. Yeah. One thing we haven't talked about, which I've got written down, which you've said that you keep coming back to, but you saw a Rothko show which infuriated you, you said, when you were young, when you were sort of in your freshman year in, at Howard. And you said that in a way he's your favourite. Painter. Yeah. For sure. But I mean, but I could probably say with certainty it wouldn't be a Rothko painting. Even though, in fact, he's my favorite painter at the end of the day, and I find his work incredibly moving. That's such a hard question to ask. I mean, I don't even know. Like, even if I said a suite of paintings. Yeah. Bottom on house, maybe. By Richter. Yeah. But then, for me personally, I'm just not going to select a suite of paintings that aren't Black. I'm just not, because it's right. just so central. I mean, I'm saying... That's great. I mean, I love Giotto's Sermon to the Birds. I mean, look, shit. The Salvatore Mundi is fucking mind-boggling to me. I'm more interested in it, and I think it's better than the Mona Lisa, to me, personally. Bill Trailer, some of his paintings, I would put right up there at the top if I had to have one thing. Basquiat, inevitably, more to choose from in that single artist than anybody anybody else. Cy Twombly's Apollo, where he just scribbled Apollo on top of a flower collage down to Warhol. Any number of the car crashes, you know, shadows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get you to say one, am I? <laughs> I just, is literally, I, like I'm trying to say, I'm sure something's <laughs> going to pop in my head. And I'm going to be like, ah, oh, yeah, if it had to be one thing. I mean, shit. 
any number of Richard Prince's girlfriends, I would be totally happy if, let's say, you, you know, like this one, well, you know, all of them are girls standing next to motorcycles, obviously, but there's one with this girl. She has a, a t shirt, I think, with a skull on it, and she's standing next to the motorcycle. That's just absolutely sublime, you know? Shit, the cover of David Bowie's low. Yeah, well, that's a magnificent image. That picture of him on the cover on the low is just magnificent. It's magnificent. Oh, the cover of Joy Division, Unknown Pleasures. By Peter Saville, yeah. Is definitely going to be in the running. Definitely going to be in the running. I mean, I'm like, my mind is tracking through all of the potential things it could be. And it's just impossible. You've had a go at it. That's fantastic. And lastly, what's art for? What is it for? Whatever you want it to be for. I don't think it has any fix. I mean, I've had big arguments with people in the past. Not about that question so much, but something related to it, which was the first time I went to the Astor Gates uh, bar. This is Pride of Love is the message. I don't understand myself as an artist. I'm not in the art world. I made my first documentary, which was, you know, Dreams of Cold and Death. And I'm there amongst all these artists. And this question comes up and I say, hold it. You guys think art has any inherent values? And they were like, yeah, we think it has inherent value. And I was just like, y'all are fucking out of your mind. I do not believe that. I don't believe art has any inherent value. I think it's all assigned value. And that is not to diminish the importance of that, but I do think it's all assigned value. So that's part of the magic of it. Is this, It's not like a lump of coal that you can heat or chicken that you can eat. You know, my oldest running joke is like, if black people are in a boat and the shit is sinking and they're trying to get to the island and they can only save one work of art, you know, Bob Dylan's Blood on the Track or Frankie Beverly and Mays, or even worse, the Mona Lisa or James Brown's Live at the Apollo, the Mona Lisa's done for. It's at the bottom of the ocean. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, what is art for? It's for whatever it is it does for you. I guess I don't believe it has any fixed function. I think it has some very unique qualities, you know, in the scope of all the things that are in the world, but I don't know that it has a specific function. Sometimes it's distraction. Sometimes it's insight. Both of those things can, even in one work, happen at the same time. It can be Profound insight and profound distraction. So, AJ, thank you so much. Thanks, man. Arthur Jaffer is at Spruth Margas in Los Angeles from the 14th of September to the 14th of December. Arthur Jaffer works from the MCA collection, is at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago until the 2nd of March 2025. And a solo show of AJ's work is at Champ Lacan in Biarritz in France until the 5th of September this year. And that's it for this episode and indeed this series. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues. That's back on the 6th of September. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X at Tan Audio and on Facebook, Instagram and Threads. Production, editing and sound design on a brush with by David Clack. And the producer is Lewis Jeb. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A big thank you to AJ. Thanks for listening. We're back in mid-September. See you then. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.